so it makes me feel like, well, I, I ought to, I feel a little less prepared than I thought I was at first, because I thought that I'd kind of exhausted the catalog of your work that was publicly available, but I kept uncovering more, you know? <laughs> <laughs> there's some old stuff on there. Uh, there, there is, yeah, there's some stuff out there, man. And, and, but the thing is, I first knew you as Jesse, Jesse Gang of Music. And so it took me a while to figure out that that was a clever play on your last name. Last name. To be honest, I don't think I even came up with that. Somebody, um, yeah, somebody must have just posted it because I was just trying to put my name, and then because like with the handles, uh -huh. you you it all gets connected. So uh, people who didn't know me personally thought that was my um, oh, <laughs> like well, I, I was go. going. <laughs> yeah, so it's just like <laughs> <laughs> it is clever. If it, it works well, you know. Yeah. Game music. Yeah, so it, it took me a while to figure out that that was actually your last name, but um, <laughs> the I, and let me let me just apologize to you right now. I I have been recovering from a cold. I didn't want to um, like I feel fine, but my voice is maybe a bit grating. I hope it's not not too uh, no. painful on your end. You're you're totally fine. You're totally fine. I just went to a uh, a food and wine festival last night, so oh, awesome. I was. I was worried that my voice would be the one not working this morning. Were you there for eating and drinking or for playing music? Just just eating and drinking. Um, my brother's fiance is a chef for Ooh. for Bon Appetit, so she had she was one of the chefs of like the for the food festival. Uh, so yeah, just hanging out, enjoying Very enjoying cool. myself. That's awesome, man. That is super awesome. Well, you know, I don't usually like open with a with a bio. Usually, I just like slide right into chatting. But I feel like maybe it wouldn't be too out of place for me to throw this in here. In fact, this is tell me if this feels like a fun joke. So I'm just gonna start <laughs> reading for a sec here and, and see how long it takes for this to set in. As as like clearly this is a joke, right? Jesse's Gang, based in Chicago in the '80s, Jesse's Gang was an urban contemporary house trio that was led by the producer, songwriter, and vocalist Jesse Saunders. Wait, that's not you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's fine. No, that, that works. Have you heard of Jesse's Gang before? No. That's the thing. Where I I came to your music as like, oh, it's Jesse Gang of Music, not this is a guy named Jesse Off Gang, right? <laughs> yep. I was like, oh, Jesse's Gang, let me get some background, you know? Uh, no, it's not, not the same <laughs> thing, no. No, here's your real bio. Jesse. Jesse has a unique musical background. He studied the Highland bagpipes, Illand bagpipes, border bagpipes, whistles, and more. I know there's more than that. <laughs> Um, he's got an undergraduate is it undergraduate degree on jazz d drum kit. Yep. Member of the 16-time World Pipe Band champions, Shots and Dykehead. You played with Shots and Dykehead? I did. To be honest, that needs to be updated because I'm no longer a member. I was I was a member. No, you. Uh, well, okay, I see. Was instead of is, but I was gonna say like don't don't stop saying you were on the band. That's <laughs> impressive, man. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, no, that, that was it was it was intense, but totally worth it. Um. Performed at Caesar's Palace. We've all been to Caesar's Palace, but you performed there. That's the difference there, right? I have. That was a long time. I was a, I was a teenager when I did that. Look at that. Like I said, you've got some stuff out there, man. <laughs> and then was it, was it pretty recently that you completed work at the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland? Or was that uh, a while yeah. ago? Yeah, that was back in... I finished in 2020. So I started gotcha. there uh, before COVID hit. And then... I would have been there for another year at least, but when everything went online, I, I finished up in 2020. Mm. Uh, and that actually was where a lot of the, the recordings came from uh, and, and where I learned about mm. kind of, I tried to make the most of not being able to perform live and dove into the, the audio production and like how to collaborate with people around the world um, I love some of that those. stuff that you did, yeah. So that, that was like part. That was, was that like officially part of your coursework, or was it just like something you you know in order to, you know, in order to perform as it were while you were busy studying? That was the way to do it. Um. So that was, I think, the answer is yes to both of those uh. questions because that was really the only way I could play with other people during that time. But I had I had to select a final project for. Um, to complete my master's so that was what i suggested i i was um hey i think 
maybe maybe a maybe a bandwidth dip or something there. Lost you for a sec. It's coming through. Okay, it's back. I don't know why. Uh... Yeah. Um, well, hopefully that's the only time. I have done a few <laughs> interviews, usually with people who are like in countries where there's not much Wi-Fi going on, and uh, it becomes a thing. Like every ten minutes, we just reset. Ten, ten. <laughs> uh, I, I apologize. I don't know what that was because it my yeah, Wi-Fi nice. my Wi-Fi was still there. It just said you huh? lost. Yeah, it just said you lost a connection to clean feed, and I had to refresh the page. I ah, gotcha. Well, well, maybe that's um. That's a, that's a great place to start because I was thinking like uh, maybe we open – instead of opening with the drones on this episode, we usually open with just drones going. We could open with one of the, with the audio from one of those videos um, and maybe – I don't know. Which one do you think would be a good opener? The, Ooh. What I'm are with, you looking for? Something like up temp to catch people Yeah, faster. sure. Something that sounds cool because I do think – I think L- Lullaby for Mel is – you did a lovely – job with that and i thought that'd be a strong finisher that'd be a great lovely okay. way to end and so um i don't know maybe the msr set or that irish GX yeah one the, let's do the yeah. msr set yeah the msr is great so so we'll open with that with with jen butterworth so as you know we'll, we've, we've been talking i don't know when we'll bring the the talking in at some point but we will at some point it'll have already happened and then uh so you tell me about your time at the royal conservatory I can't help but say conservatoire like I'm very fancy. And then I, uh, <laughs> tell me about the MSR set as well, if you would. Um, yeah, so my my time at the the Royal Conservatoire, and they do say conservatoire. I got uh, mm. I got scolded for calling it a conservatory when I was over there. I wow. uh, and now and uh, now everybody over here makes fun of me when I say conservatoire. Yeah, <laughs> um, but it was it was a great experience, and just living in Glasgow. Uh, whether at RCS or not, it's it's like you you throw a stone and you hit a great piper. Um, mm-hmm. It's it's crazy. The not just the competition piping scene there, but the the Scottish folk music scene. Um, it's just it, it's so alive with some of the best Scottish um, and Irish music in the world. So it, it feels uh, to me so much like we are as as bagpipe enthusiasts, you know, like. We're a community that is so so heavily in diaspora, and like our mecca is is the, you know this such a small place if, if that makes sense you know like like most of us are outsiders to the birthplace if that you, you know what I mean and so yeah <laughs> you 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 did you did the Hodge thing you made it you did the journey <laughs> <laughs> yeah it really is use the word mecca it really is the yeah. mecca of the the piping world um and. I, it's interesting to like think about how even piping in the the states or Canada or Australia, it a lot of it can be traced back to Glasgow. Um, mm-hmm. I think about my um, my teacher back on the East Coast uh, in Connecticut. He was um, seventy nine years old when I met him, but he immigrated to the states. I want to say back in the late 50s or 60s mm. uh and he's from Clydebank so even me as a, a piper from Connecticut can be traced back to just outside Glasgow they're just a step uh, or two back and I bet most of us end up there in our in our um uh, what's the word for our pedagogy is that the word pedagogy uh for the teaching of teaching right yeah um yeah no so it's 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 hard to get get away from there and it's it's still you think about like the top grade one bands, uh, most of them uh, have rehearsals either in Glasgow or not far from Glasgow. Even hmm. even like Inverary and you think of them as up <laughs> in Inverary, <laughs> but, <he> <laughs> yeah, but I, I, uh, I'm pretty sure that they have some rehearsals in Glasgow or yeah. like Fieldmore. Um, it's 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 pretty it's pretty wild. A night out, you're you're bump into any number of great pipers. It's, it, I, I've never been to Europe myself in, 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 in any part of Europe at all. But so like aside from just aside from the high concentration of, of like really good pipers and piping history and stuff, it also blows my mind to imagine, you know, I'm not only from the United States, but from like the newest part of the United States, by which I mean like the most recently integrated into the country parts. Mm-hmm. Not Hawaii or Alaska, you know, but you know, toward that end. I'm out west anyway, right? 
to, to be in a place where not only can you throw a stone one way and hit a great pipe, or you can throw a stone another way and hit any number of like buildings that have been standing there for three times as long as my country's even existed, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. Or longer. You know? <laughs> it is so funny to think about, like, really how young America is in general. But yeah. Compare when you're over there. I'm like, you go to a church, an old church, to me, like an old New England church, mm-hmm. it is, seems old, but then, <laughs> then it's nothing, they've had churches. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just a baby. The people who built that old New England church, their great, 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 great grandparents <laughs> built a church on the other side. <laughs> Exactly. Speaking of, exactly. of old New England churches, I've one of the things that I, I loved seeing you do not too long ago was playing your pipes, or was it a whistle with the pedal board? Uh, yeah, it was a it was a whistle with the yeah. pedal board. I've, um, I've, I'm sitting here at my makeshift organ desk. I'm not a good organ player, but an enthusiast for sure. And so seeing you do that really got me excited. I love seeing that. Uh, yeah, no, I'm I I play. I'm not a great organist myself, but I do play, and I'm trying to do more more with the pedals and whistles and I've done some with the pedals and illin pipes but uh, I haven't I haven't posted any of that yet it hasn't it hasn't met the standard man that that's the next frontier right when you can have your chanter play in your melody and then have like your regulators on the alto part and your feet on the bass right <laughs> that yeah someday someday Tell the church choir they can take the day off Jesse's got it <laughs> uh, that's the idea but uh Baby steps, baby steps. Yeah. Just whistle and pedals for now. Yeah. Uh, the, but for me, I came from um, playing drum set, so oh, the sure. coordin- the coordination between the hands and the feet, I have a little bit of exper- the experience there. But it's still, it's still weird to try to play a whistle tune and then have my feet not <laughs> not tapping the the poles and uh-huh. trying to, you know how it is as an organist of trying to play. A bunch of different rhythms at the same time oh, man. and I, have it all i use the uh the add bass button most of the time <laughs> just because <laughs> it's one one thing too many man oh i wish i had so i i'm so lucky to play on the organ i do but it is it does not have that that function mm-hmm. it's a mm-hmm. it's a tracker mm-hmm. uh <laughs> this is becoming an organ podcast not a piping podcast right but, <laughs> <laughs> but you can drone on that as well for sure absolutely I do love the sound of organ and pipes, uh, pipes together. Oh, they go together great. I, I I was introduced to the idea of mixing their wild energies by Timothy Cummings. By by the way, you're you're like generally in that that part of the world. You ever come across Timothy Cummings in, in, in like you know directly personally? No, I not not directly. You guys almost um, look like you could even be cousins. <laughs> A couple of New England bagpipers, you know. <laughs> well, we'll have to play some tunes sometime. Yeah, that'd be great. Now, actually, speaking of which, you know, appearance-wise, and speaking of there being a lot of stuff from from your earlier days out there on the internet, did you know that if anybody listening wants to know what Jesse Offgang looks like, you can find a photo of him playing drums shirtless in a kilt with long hair. You, you got to dig a little, but it's out there. <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god! That must have been, I, my excuse was it was a very hot day at that festival. Sure, sure, it, sure. It must have been. That's probably going to have to be the cover art for this episode. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, that was, that was a long time ago. If I still had hair, that, that, was, that was a long time ago. When we say hair, we're talking about hair down to uh, <laughs> below my, my backside. I, I never had a haircut until I was like 24 years old. Wow, man, that, that's that's pretty pretty darn impressive. Here I am. Just earlier this week, I I got impatient with it touching my ears and like shaved my own hair off. I I did not have that kind of patience. Uh, well, I didn't know any better. Uh, now that I have short hair, I'm like, wow, that was a pain. That was a pain. <laughs> if you're gonna do it, do it first thing in your life, right? Don't save it for later. <laughs> yep, uh, you'll never be able to tolerate it. Mm. Now you in those days you were playing with the band. Is it? Did you pronounce it Mac Talamore? Yeah, Mac Talamore. Um, Great Echo or or Big Echo would be the, the oh, translation. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, I played with. That was all my family. Uh, oh, that's your brother, family. Brother, sister, mother. Yep. We I were, didn't realize that. Yeah, so it was a it was a family affair. Uh, we did it for a while. You put um, out a few albums. There's there's some stuff out there. Yeah, yeah, we did we did four albums. Um, 
And that was all, that was before, like, there was kind of that explosion of home recording. So we mm-hmm. were doing it um, all through studios. It was kind of cool. It was great at a young age for me to get to experience um, recording four, four albums in a studio, mm. uh, both the really positive aspects of it and the stressful as- aspects of like, okay, we paid for however many days, we got to get this album done mm. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> in, in four days. And, oh, it's exhausting when you have those 10-hour days in, in a recording studio and then keeping pipes in tune. Oh. Probably, if I, li- if I listen back to those albums, I'd probably be like, oh, Maybe I didn't keep them in tune as much as I had hoped. <laughs> no, uh, I, I think you pulled it off well. As as a person who's been digging through them deeply for the last couple of weeks, I can tell you, I th- I'm impressed. It, it, especially because, uh, you know, so much of my interpretation of the world is, like, very me-centric, you know? Like, I tend, I tend very strongly to think that if I just barely found out about something, it's because it just got discovered, and, it, and not that it's been around for a long time and I was just ignorant of it, you know? And it feels to me like in those years, I never heard of a B-flat chanter, like a chanter that was made to be played at concert pitch. And so it feels to me like you must have been getting a standard chanter and just like working with the reed. But maybe I'm wrong. Did you did you find some concert pitch stuff to work with? So it was much less common back back then. Yeah. Um, we're talking back in the early 2000s um, that I think people were playing with other instruments like there was the Tannehill weavers oh, yeah. uh, but it, it it was much you didn't hear it quite as much and then you had guys like Gordon Duncan who and it started to be this explosion of of using the the Highland pipes mm-hmm. uh, in more uh, what I'd call creative settings but yeah it was it was really hard to tune down to pitch uh, especially when you'd be playing a festival that hits. <laughs> 95 yeah. degrees Fahrenheit right. to stay at concert pitch. Even even now with a B flat chanter can be quite challenging. Um, I think I was able to purchase. Um, I forget what maker a, a B flat chanter around 2005, something like that. Or um, I know what some other people had done was find like vintage chanters oh, that yeah. were yeah. just just flat that's how they made them back back before um, the creep was was quite so strong <laughs> before people were trying to get their pipe band to sound yeah <laughs> brighter and brighter yeah um i do think uh that that is going to be eventually a trend that goes away that the pipes will will pick a a pitch so that they can use more uh, play with other instruments more Man, more I, easily. And aside from being able to play with other instruments more easily, I don't know about where you where you are at in the country or where you play in general, but I know for me, geographically where I'm at right here at least, if that's a factor, B flat chanters are way more balanced and stay like rock steady for a lot longer than what I'm used to. Like I would much rather play a B flat chanter than any of my band chanters um, uh, for those reasons. Yeah, so that uh, that's actually interesting. I I feel somewhat uh Shame to say this, but I so rarely play anything but my B flat chanter right mm, now mm-hmm. that I'm I I can't even comment on the the stability of mm. what I call a sharp chanter because in in my world at this point um, that's what's weird is the what yeah I would call a normal one yeah that's interesting <laughs> yeah um, now I have promised a few students who are playing sharper chanters that I would get my get my sharp chanter going so I could play with them. Mm. Um, but yeah, no, I just, I I think it was that I wanted to get my sound on my B-flat B chanter to a place that I was happy with. Um, so I wanted to make, set up my pipes so that was the best sound rather than having my pipes set up for a chanter that I don't really use in yeah. the context that I'm, I'm not competing in solos. I haven't for the past 15 years. Um, and I'm not playing with a band right now. So I have really... Other than a, a, a solo piping gig, um, I would have no use for a sharp chanter. And of course, uh, for those those solo gigs, you can always go play B flat. It's not going to be like, hang on a sec, <laughs> the piper at the um, wedding didn't sound bright enough. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, and even if a piper shows up, they might just comment of like, oh, your pipes are a little sound a little bit flat, and I I would tell them why they sound flat, but uh, mm. and hopefully they don't. It's not because of note. It's <laughs> <laughs> right. ridiculously out of tune. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
But yeah, no, so that's where I just, that's mostly what I do if I play a solo gig. Mm-hmm. So I'll just have my, my B-flat chanter going. I just, I'll say that. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say that now the opposite side, and if if it's a, a funeral in the winter in New England, mm. no matter what chanter I'm playing, <laughs> it's, it's very flat. Yeah, yeah. Then your then your B flat suddenly a concert A in what way? That's fun. <laughs> uh, that'll be the next. I wanna. I would have loved to have a set eventually entirely in A. But yeah, yeah, yeah. The um the 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 debate. I guess is it even a debate? I don't know. Maybe all of us are ready for for B flat to become standard, and we're just kind of all sitting around waiting for somebody in a position of authority or something right. to say, "Let's do it." <laughs> or. Or conversely, I think that um, I think that we might be settled on being natural because when you listen to some of these uh, solo players who are pushing four ninety, they're very close to concert concert be natural. Interesting. At that point, uh, and I know G one just uh, released their 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 be natural chanter. I you know I saw uh, Piper Alley put something out about a B a B. Uh, natural chanter that she used and I thought to myself maybe that was a typo maybe she meant B flat because surely she meant B flat but no that's a thing then huh B no well, it's and here I am I just bought my concert a chanter now I have to buy another one huh? <laughs> I, uh, yes it's like owning a boat this uh this <laughs> right. hobby of ours yeah, totally uh, yeah no but the B so and, and I think um probably the B chanter you wouldn't really need you obviously have to adjust the drum reads but I think um, because pipes have been getting sharper and sharper. I don't really think you would need... I don't know this because I haven't played one, but I don't think you'd need to do much special to your drones to get that to work. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I will have to get one of them as well. Uh, skip a few lunches and then yeah. buy my... Make that happen, <laughs> my yeah. Teacher. Yeah, man. Yeah, now... Um... In, I, I'm curious, like while while we're kind of toward the beginning of your of your musical career here with the family band, do you happen to be familiar with the band Wookie Foot? I I know they had pipes in a song. Yeah. Or small pipes, it, right? No, they had high, well, they had Highland pipes in a few songs actually. Okay. If you if you if you're into like hippie philosophy, this is a great group. I I do like Wookie Foot quite a lot. But here's the thing, they've got an album that came out in 2012. It's called Ready or Not. It's one of my favorites of theirs. Really great. Um, and they've got a tune on there called All Together. Oh, wait. No, wait. That's, is that it? No, it's from, the, it's from Be Fearless and Play. Another great album. But the tune is called All Together. They've got Highland Pipes in there. When I listen to that tune, and I listen to uh, U.S. Reggae... I'm like, hang on a sec, hang on a sec. Was Mark Murphy in the crowd when you played that tune? Because I'm not, I'm not accusing Wookie Foot of stealing anything. Because I think it's possible. I think in both cases, Itchy Fingers gets used. So maybe that's the more the connection that's happening in my head. Is that right? Did, did Itchy Fingers come in in U.S. Reggae, or am I thinking wrong? Uh, uh, that so Itchy Fingers was a track on the same album. Oh. Uh, in U.S. Reggae, I'm trying to think what tune was in there. I don't think it was Itchy Fingers. I have to. I'll okay. Have to... Well, maybe, maybe it's it. the fact that it was on the album is why it was swimming around in my brain. But yeah, no, I'll have to I'll have to check out more of Wookie Foot stuff. I was um I was working on <laughs> I wanted to learn more about farming, so I was working on an organic farm one summer, and uh, uh, yeah, the mat the manager was a big that, Wookie Foot that totally fan. Makes sense. Uh, and when he <laughs> was, found was out I played bagpipes, <laughs> yes, it was an organic farm. Totally and... makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's Wookie Foot country. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, so he that's where I first discovered Wookie Foot, and he played me some tracks with. Um, I think the track I listened to at Small Pipes, but I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to take a dive into their their albums and and give more of a listen. Oh, I could recommend it. My kids maybe are getting sick of Wookie Foot because of how often I use their songs to quote little words of wisdom to my children when they've like misbehaved or something. I'm like, hey, you know, stop crying because if it ain't if it ain't all right, it ain't the end, you know. And they're like, shut up, dude. <laughs> they're like, get your philosophy from someplace else. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, but I well, love it, the, the bagpipes and uh, hippie jam band oh, yeah, <laughs> crossover. Dude. It's, it, any, any kind of fusion is exciting, right? But yeah, it, mm-hmm. feels, it feels kind of unique. And actually, that means let's pull in another track here because it's another one that I, speaking of combining bagpipes with stuff, it's, it's not weird to combine bagpipes with harp. That totally makes sense. But it is, to me, like weird in that I'm like, whoa, that was that. I imagine that it must have been challenging to combine Highland Pipes with a harp, which is what you did um, with, uh, what, which one was the track? So was... I did that with two, uh, Lullaby for Mel would have been the one with Highland Pipes That's and right. Harp. And I am still um, thinking, like, let's listen to that one on our way out of the episode, but maybe, do you want to tell me a little bit about that and maybe with it, maybe it's a catalyst to talk to me a bit about, like, you know, what what recording is like for you these days and what what... You know what? What are you discovering, or what things have you found work well, and stuff like that? Because just the imbalance of the volume level, you know, I can kind of think to myself that must have been a challenge to get bagpipes and harp to blend. Yes, Highland uh, pipes specifically. And I mean, this is the magic of the the recording studio. Um, and I'm gonna spill the beans on a lot of people who no <laughs> spill them. I think that's healthy for all you, of us. <laughs> release YouTube videos, yeah. and uh, most of who we listen to, and most of what we see, whether it's bagpipers or like I'm a huge Jacob Collier fan. A lot of what we see is the audio is recorded separately, and then it's truly just a live music video. So mm-hmm. uh, blending the harp and the bagpipes, if we were just playing acoustically like you would see in the video for Lullaby for Mel next to each other, that would have been extremely difficult. Standing way really uh, too close to each other for that, huh? <laughs> yeah, unless you have very close mics or pickups. Yeah. Um, so the audio, we actually recorded the audio for that. I was living in Scotland when I recorded the audio for that, and she recorded that in the closet of her apartment at the time. That's so, so cool. <laughs> uh, she would send send me the her recording from... From Connecticut, someplace in Connecticut, I was in uh, a living on, somewhere in Connecticut. <laughs> Connecticut, yep, and I was living on uh, a sheep farm in the borders of Scotland. <laughs> Is that where uh, you were staying while you were at the conservatory? Uh, that when when COVID hit. Um, so at the conservatory, I was li- living in downtown Glasgow. On, okay, because uh, I'm Saki- imagine, I was imagining you commuting from a sheep farm to get to school every day. <laughs> that, yeah, the most Scottish thing ever. Yeah. Um, no, I was living on, on Saki Hall Street. Mm. Um, <laughs> it, it's like the. It was very easy to get to um, RCS from there, but mm. I don't think I slept all oh. year. <laughs> I, that was uh, bar and nightclub central, so it was. Uh, yeah. It's a little bit difficult. I could practice my pipes at any hour, though, and There's nobody the complained. Lining. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so so she um, would send me the recordings. I we used. I was using Pro Tools at the time and just uh, using a click track to line everything up. Um, and then I made an outline for all the other pipers on that um, on that track. And they'd have to be listening while they played along. That was actually really challenging to get the pipes close to in tune for, for eight pipers and then oh, have yeah. everybody synced up. That, that particular recording um, was probably the most difficult to to coordinate i think there's eight or nine pipers on it yeah and um and harp and then filming all the video so uh the video for it um haley the harpist and she's she also went to rcs um but i think several years ago before i went Mm. um so we both being from connecticut we met up to uh to film the videos uh, because one of uh, one of my one of my other recordings, she wrote the tune for, and it was based on the the farm that we recorded the, that video on. Oh, so, gotcha. so to to get back to your original question about balancing the levels, um, it was a lot easier to do because I was using Pro Tools, and then the sound you're not hearing the actual sound from what you're seeing on the screen. And I I hate to burst the the YouTubers <laughs> the YouTubers bubble, but um, that's that's how a lot of 
a lot of people do. Some of my recordings I'm doing both at the same time. Yeah. Um, a big giveaway that a person is not doing them at the same time is if they're not wearing headphones. Oh, and, sure. yeah, yeah. And they're they're performing with somebody else. Um, it's there's a great chance that they're not. It's not a live mm -hmm. uh, recording because they need to be able to hear a click track or uh, the other instruments, and that would show up on the. The microphone. This is yeah. getting very technical at this point. Not no, to bore your listeners. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I think that this is something that everybody's going to be into. You know, it's part of it's part of what we're we're all consuming these videos all the time and stuff like that. And, and honestly, Jesse, like I remember when Ross Miller came out with his album The Rope, and he was perfectly willing to say out loud that he'd recorded the drones separately from the chanter. And oh why, yeah. Why does that? It shouldn't have been taboo in any way, but for some reason it felt like he was revealing a secret. You know. But uh, the thing is, that, like, it gives us all permission to be like, oh, when I tried to record myself and it didn't sound like Ross Miller on the Roke, there's a reason why. You know, it's okay to, like, do things professionally when you're trying to make a professional thing. It's totally okay. <laughs> right. And I, but I, and I also think it's kind of important that people talk about our, our process because it's not just in the piping world, but in the recording world in general, there is um, almost an obsession with perfection. Mm -hmm. uh, and... Nobody is as good as the recording sound is like what I like to say because even in the classical world, they are they have as many takes as they need. Yeah. Um, you can I you can splice in a good audio engineer. You can edit multiple takes to fit them together. So um, and there's nothing wrong with that as a process. But I think uh, because I teach a lot, I, I try to tell my students like, hey. I make a lot more mistakes, and even, and even when I release, I I release things that are far from perfect. But um, the thing about being in the studio is, if I make a big mistake, I just don't <laughs> don't post that. And yeah, right, right. Uh, so I tell my students, like when they think they're making mistakes, I'm like, hey, I I'm a sloppy jalopy all over the place. I am, but that is interesting with Ross and meaning to that. I, I also record my drones separately sometimes if it is a track that I think I'm going to need to do a lot of editing for mm -hmm. because one thing about that solid drone sound, um, I can't very, uh, it's much more difficult to do. I can't splice two takes together if I'm taking the drones and the chanter at the same time because you'll hear that drone change. So I can uh, very carefully splice two tracks together if it's like on a grace note, and I, what I don't think the listener would hear. Yeah. But if I recorded the drones at the same time, that would be exceptionally difficult to do. Yeah. Um, and it's actually, uh, I was taking audio production lessons with um, a guy named Duncan Lyle. He's um, a great bass player, a, a trad bass player, and he's um, an audio engineer. And that was his advice when he records bagpipes. Um, he was like, really, if you can record your drones separately, it makes the editing process so much easier. Because mm -hmm. um, the other thing is, when you're playing, at, at, like Ross Miller plays with uh, other instruments all the time, mixing the drones in can be quite challenging. And if you have it connected to the chanter, if it's all going at once, sometimes you don't want the drones as loud. If, if, if somebody's playing a chord that really clashes mm. with that B flat. Yeah. Uh, I ran into that with uh, um, the harp sometimes that if a note was ringing out and the drones were, were blaring away, uh, it can be Get really, uh, yeah, really money. And then the other thing about the drones is they take up so much of the sound stage mm -hmm. if, if you really have them going. And then it, it's constantly like, what do you want the listener to be focused on? If I'm playing something on solo pipes, if it was just a pipe solo, I would probably almost always record the drones together with the chanter because I want that full rich sound i want that balance um but as soon as i start recording with other instruments um i might not want the drones as prominent um sometimes you do again it's it depends on um what you're going for creatively yeah but the drones do take up a lot of that a lot of that sound stage and then there's only so much our ears can hear at once uh, oh, yeah. so that's yeah. Uh, and it's also interesting to talk to pipers versus non-pipers of how much they want to hear the drones. Because, Isn't that uh, interesting? Like, <laughs> it's like 
I, I try playing with other instruments as a as a hobby sometimes, you know, with my like my friends who play folk instruments and stuff like that. And it's funny how often the drones are a real barrier for my friends that like they're like, well, what chord do I switch to now? Because your drones are still going, you know. And it's like, oh, well, I guess to some degree, just imagine my drones aren't there, you know. <laughs> but like, <laughs> if we play bagpipes, we probably have all like naturally already been weeded out as like the type of person who loves a drone, you know. And that's just not everybody. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I'm drawn to even music that has drones that are not pipe music. There's like some Indian music yeah, that me too, really man. is Absolutely. heavy, <laughs> heavy drone use. Even in choral music, if I hear like a, a high soprano drone, yeah, I, I love the sound of like a pedal tone yeah um i I, i've wondered before if that's like it's just like part of the wiring that some of us just you know (laughs) whether it's it's choral stuff it's hurdy-gurdies it's you know like sitars that have a constant thing in the background you know like whatever the instrument or anything like we just like that we're drawn the sound of the drum yeah or like a shrewdy box i love that Uh, it just i i think any music is better with a drone uh as long as the as long as the harmonies are able to to fit with it at least sometimes right as long as they <laughs> yeah, come in and yeah. out here and there <laughs> uh but it's also interesting from a, a guitar player's perspective i was playing um some illin pipes and the tune was in a minor but i had the d drone still on um huh. and it worked but it really changed the chords that he was choosing to play oh interesting. Uh, because the way he was hearing it off of that d drone it, so it, it's it can it can be a cool creative tool and sometimes it does just get in the way that's something i i really like about the uh inland pipes is having the ability to shut them off when you want to if you really mm. want to focus on a minor rather than having the big big d drone there um yeah. and i'll do that with highland pipes as well play without drones but uh, i do i think there is something about the drones that mellows out the chanter a bit so listening to a Highland pipe changer without drones, I, I, even for my ears as a piper, can be a bit harsh. Yeah, 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 that, that makes sense. And, and you know, like, I, I don't know, I'm not trying to say that, like, this is, like, hard-hitting, like, frontier um, fr- frontier exploration kind of stuff to, to talk about it openly here. Like, you know, probably generally people are already aware and stuff like that, right? But it does feel a little bit like, like you say, in the, in the position of a teacher yourself, right? Like, uh clarifying expectations a bit demystifying a bit i guess it's not to take away from professional pipers playing like we love listening to it of course and we will remain fans forever regardless right but uh understanding a little bit about why i can't sit down and in one take sound like i mean there are great pipers out there who can sit down and in one take sound like they sound right but um so i'm not trying to take away from people's skill in any way but uh understanding the magic of how it goes together is certainly interesting um, oh yeah and and i mean there's there's amazing players that you just sit there recording all day and like I, it doesn't even matter if there's a, a mistake but um but there's also even I'm, I'm sure even fred morrison when he's recording his album doesn't just go in and play 11 tracks and then done he's done in an hour it's it's probably multiple takes i i don't know his recording process but um yeah, it's it's a it's a different thing being in a studio or doing home recordings than performing a live show. Yeah, which you've done plenty of live shows too. Um, do you maybe maybe take me back in some of your chronological story? You know, playing with a with a family band. When did this start? When did pipes start? Was it something encouraged by your parents, or did you you know come home from school one day and be like, guess what? <laughs> I want to play bagpipes. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um. So I actually, it, it was, it came from my, my mother. We had, I'm one of four, four children, so um, I have three siblings. Um, and we all had to play a musical instrument. It was just a rule in the house. But I, so I took piano lessons as a, a little kid and I didn't stick with it. And then uh, they tried to get me to learn the violin and I, I hated it. I, so far, now, this is sounding like a real classic story. <laughs> oh, my God. I, I, I was supposed to take piano. I didn't stick with it. They wanted to make me take violin. I, I hated it. So this is, Well, so, you know. yeah, violin, they, uh, they, the teacher was coming, and I, was, I wasn't a bad kid. I was just uh, obstinate, and I climbed up into a tree. Really? And I, <laughs> would, it, I would not come down for my lesson. Now, now, granted, I'm seven or eight years old here, so I'm yeah. giving myself some of a pass. Uh, but yeah, so that was my last violin lesson was atop that tree, uh, the, the poor teacher. Um, 
And then, um, so I took some time off and my mother uh, decided just out of whim to buy me a practice chanter. And Had, had she uh, played pipes or did she know other pipers? What, why would she play uh, the chanter? She had always, so growing up, she would be listening to the Tana Hill Weavers, mm -hmm. um, the Pogues. Like she, she loved uh, traditional music. Mm -hmm. um, and she played some, um, she was a, a, a bit of a percussionist herself. Um, so she's like, okay, we'll, we'll have you try, we'll have you try pipes. And I just got, cause I knew nothing about the world and she really didn't either. We got lucky, um, with, uh, this man named, uh, Tommy Shearer who lived in Newtown, uh, another piper in, in the town I grew up in, who's also a very good piper in his own right. Uh, I was going to take lessons from him and he, he was going off to college at the time so he gave me the number of his teacher and yeah it was just a, a word of mouth thing we wouldn't have known mm. anybody but this guy turned out to be um an amazing amazing teacher and and player he was i like i said he was 79 when i met him i could not understand a word he said mm. my first <laughs> i was this 12 year old uh and he still had that uh the accent and coming from just outside glasgow <laughs> a little bit of a stronger uh, a the, little the bit more of that difficult of the range. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but it was it was such an <laughs> that before. That's funny. Um, yeah, and it was such an amazing experience. I always joke like that guy changed my life because he he was such a good good teacher. I joke with people. I'm like, if not for him, I would have gone to medical school and I'd be a doctor right now. And oh, instead, can instead you I imagine? And, and, and instead I uh, I play bagpipes all the time. <laughs> So, so it's his fault. Um, well, but, but you know, one he really... the lucky ones who got a really good start then. Yeah. No, so, and, so many and of us have to relearn stuff after we've started, you know. That and, and that's probably the most common thing that happens to me when people come to take lessons from me is mm. that the first first little while is, is relearning relearning things. But he, he really gave me that foundation. And it, uh, it came full circle when I was taking a class at RCS with Willie McCallum. And, and Willie asked me who my teacher was, uh, as I, I think he was complimenting my playing. He's like, okay, well, so you sound pretty good. And in, in America, there's, it's hard to find instructors. We, we live in such a big country. Like you and I both live in America and <laughs> we're <laughs> probably, probably easier for me to get to Scotland than it would be to get to where. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and he asked me who I studied with. So I said, Tommy Shura and Willie had heard that name because the band he played in growing up, Tommy had been in before he was, so it's, he knew of my teacher from back whenever he was still living in, in Scotland. Wow. So it was kind of cool for me to go back to that, like, wow, uh, that, that full circle. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, Super cool. Now, and he, that was Highland Pipes exclusively, right? Highland Pipes exclusively. I didn't start on the, um, the Illin Pipes or the Border Pipes so much much later. Illin Pipes, uh, I had always wanted to play them, but they are not an inexpensive instrument to start right. on. So. Yeah, for so many of us, that's like the pie in the sky thing. It's like, maybe never. I might not live long enough to get Illin Tonight. Pipes. <laughs> I, might, I might not never make enough. My thought was I might never make enough money to, be right. able to yeah. afford one of these sets. And I think that uh, is something that the Illin Pipe community uh, would would really benefit from having a, a less expensive and, and it's hard it, because the makers are so artisan and they're they're they it, it's hard for them to make a living it's it's just very difficult to get started on that instrument if you're not near a piper's club that can loan you right. an instrument because people will ask me they're like how much am i going to get spent uh, i would love to play illin pipes <laughs> how yeah. much do I need to spend? How much is a set? And I'm like, oh god. Yeah. Um, you hate to crush somebody's <laughs> dreams right then and there, don't you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But th th that being said, um, I was fortunate enough. It, it's really if you if you're willing to dig around and and you find these pipers clubs. Oftentimes there are loaner sets. I was fortunate. That another piper had a, a starter set that he let me borrow that I could kind of get started without making the multiple thousand dollar commitment um just to know that i was gonna do it and stick with it and then uh, right. finally when i graduated college and had a a, a job uh i i bought a car and a set of villain pipes <laughs> those, <laughs> which, those, which of the two was more expensive <laughs> oh the the, the pipes yeah the pipes. 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I, this wasn't the finest car ever, but it was definitely the only finest. This is the classic musician thing where you use a use a vehicle that's that's like monetary value is half the the value of the instruments that you're you're using it to carry around, right? Uh, I, to get to your gigs, <laughs> to try to make the money back oh, no. to pay off your instrument. It literally, I was driving like. Uh, a fourth generation hand-me-down car yeah and this thing couldn't have been worth more than seven hundred dollars like if somebody's and gonna then, break into your car like take the car please <laughs> well because i had my illin pipes there i had my highland pipes in there and then i had my border pipes and Ooh. when i did the math on that i'm like i'm driving a seven hundred dollar car with i don't want to say the the number on those pipes but we can all it, imagine it, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was uh, a, a ridiculous um, juxtaposition right there. By, by the way, if anybody's curious, I did a quick Google, and it, it, to get from where you're at to where I'm at, you'd still have to go another 700 miles for distance to get to the UK, so we're, we're about <laughs> we're about 2,500 miles apart, you and I, Okay. and you probably okay. have to go about 3,000 to get to the UK, so, <laughs> you know, we're, 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 we're still in the neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Where are, where are you based at? Uh, I'm in Utah, right, right in the middle of Utah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah I mean, now it seems like you you do. Speaking of distances, it seems like you travel a bit. Um, but like in some of your videos and stuff, like the background is just a postcard for Connecticut. It's just lovely. Um, <laughs> do you feel like like I, I've always wondered like it's it's the phenomenon of like be having your heart tied to a place is interesting to me, you know. And so like having spent some time living in other places as well as just traveling around, do you still feel like there's a little cord tied to your heart that connects to Connecticut? Like you know where it is at all times? And are there aspects of the land there that you love to see when you come back home from a trip? Or are you now a citizen of the Western Hemisphere? You know what I mean? <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I, I think myself, like a lot of people from Connecticut, um, tend to hate on Connecticut, but there really are some beautiful spots. We all hate and... on our own places, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the grass is always greener. Um, yeah. But there, there's some beautiful spots. And then it's when you grow up someplace. I grew up next to a thousand acres of forest. Mm. Um, and my family is all still in Connecticut. So there is, even when I was living in Scotland, which to me is the, the most beautiful country I've ever ever been to. Speaking of grass going, is greener, quite literally, huh? Literally, <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and going up to the highlands and the, like, the, it, you just feel like you're in, uh, in a movie set. Like, yeah. you're like wait, no, this yeah. is, this is everyday life. Uh, but there's, there's always going to be a part that, like, Connecticut, I'm, I'm, my family's there and I'm, I'm just so comfortable in Connecticut. Yeah, sure. Uh, that, that, that feeling of being home. But I, I would say that Scotland, and I've heard a lot of people say this, there is a warmth to that country mm -hmm. that uh, I've, I've heard people say they like, they get off their plane and they're like, oh, I, I feel like I'm home immediately mm -hmm. here. Uh, and, uh, but in Connecticut, one of the things I like to do with, uh, with these recordings is, is find cool places to film yeah. the videos. Uh, and that's also, I guess one of the positives I think about, because we, we could talk about the positives and negatives of social media, but releasing the music there, it's really important to have the visual. Mm. Um, uh, sometimes when I'm like doing all the audio stuff, I'm like, I need to make sure that my backgrounds are better because we've got to, <laughs> we're, we're, we're posting to hopefully get views and the, the, uh, the visual in many ways is equally, if not more important than, um, the audio you can just Jesse, see I, i've got the solution for you and it's free <laughs> just dig up that photo that photo are you playing drums with no shirt on <laughs> every, every single every single release from now on man <laughs> <laughs> the shirtless drums oh my yeah. god i don't i don't know if i want to see this photo <laughs> any listeners who go look that up i apologize <laughs> Oh, that's, that's 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 pretty cool though. That's um, you know, I spent I spent a very short time at Dell Tech. That's the most like, um, in, in like personal. I guess I traveled to uh um to uh uh. <laughs> it's silly that now I'm blanking the name of it. What's the big uh, Civil War battleground? Uh, Getty, Gettysburg. Get, Gettysburg. Yeah, I traveled to Gettysburg. That's like the most traveling I've done in that part of the country. So right. what little I saw was lovely, but I have very little uh, experience. Of no, it. There's, there's, there's lovely parts. I see for me, I really want to go to the, your side of the Utah. I have so many friends uh, and family that tell me that it's just spectacularly beautiful. Come over, man. Um, 
Colorado hosts this uh, Spanish Peaks um, Pipers and Harpers gathering every once in a while. They're always- a Pipers and Harpers gathering. Yeah, man. Yeah. We see if we can get you on the get you on their on their uh, radar for an instructor position or something. It's like you know, it's like a weekend thing. You know, that a sounds small great. school. Get you some reasons to come over to the side of the country. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd absolutely love that. Yeah. Now, um, I want to talk to you about Kit a little more. I don't think we could nerd out too much about it. And you mentioned your border pipes. Um, you've got this quartet for border pipes and piano with uh, Joanna Stark and Alex. Is it Prentis? Max McWhorter. Uh- Yep. Is Max McWhorter related to Steve McWhorter? Or is that Mine, just a coincidence? I think that's just a coincidence, oh. but I, I would have to double check that. Um, I've never actually met Max in person. That was another that's so cool. <laughs> recording, so I, I'd have you know, to... Of course it would be better to be able to meet in person. I think it's one of the cool things about it. any silver lining from uh, from COVID is, is things like that uh, and the, just the ability now that I, I can casually write to somebody 
in Australia or right. Hong Kong and be like, hey, do you want to do a duet? Uh, do you want to play tunes together? That And I, yeah. I think that's awesome. That is awesome. But but in that in that video, I get a good, you know, we get a good view of your border pipes. Um, you got a lot of hardware on the chanter. Tell me about the set you play. Who made it and, and what kind of, you know, what what keys and stuff do you have on there? Yeah, so that is um, that was made by Nigel Richards. It's a Garvey. They're Garvey border pipes, uh, and I had the the chanter that he was making when I purchased them. It had a high B key, mm. which you kind of it's if anybody's familiar with clarinet, it's it's kind of like a little key above the high A hole um, that you play, and it, it that one there's a high B, and then there was a low. Uh, where you play with your our unused pinky mm. uh, on that chanter you use a lot because it has a low F sharp, uh, a low E, and that low F sharp key also doubles as you could play a low G sharp. So it gives quite a few extra notes on the chanter. It took me a lot of practice to get comfortable with it and also just like used to having it in the hand with that, with that bar and having the keys there. Mm -hmm. uh, that so makes sense quite, why it looks like so much hard work. That would be, it's got to be pretty long to reach down there, right? Yeah, to get that low E. Yeah. Um, and I love it. it. It really adds to the tunes you can play and kind of wanting to play more in sessions, wanting to play more with other instruments. Um, there's a lot more that just the high B alone adds so many tunes you can play. And then oh, yeah, yeah. Just going down to the low E as well, also playing in different keys. Um, so there's a lot of creative possibilities. It's something I want to do in the next year or two is explore more of what that chanter can do um and then i've, I've always thought of like taking it to a, a highland maker and being like hey listen can you right. duplicate this for and, and i don't know the answer on that they, there might be um physics reasons why they can i want uh, to say yes because i want it to be true i want that to be a thing that would be awesome <laughs> yeah no and and i think uh like from a, a harmony perspective as well just having the ability to go down to that that low E would add so much, um, yeah, so much flavor to what we could do. Uh, you think about harmonies. what one more note on top does. Well, why would oh, yeah. one more note on bottom also open up the repertoire a ton? Yeah, yeah, no. So I, 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 I think there's a lot of room for growth and 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 more creativity, even uh, in the next next twenty years. One thing is that pipers can be. Um, somewhat stuck in um, wanting to keep, and this is this is always a fine line, but wanting to keep things as traditional as they were. I think particularly in the, the competition scene, of course, um, yeah. there is, it's, it's slow to change, which, um, which I think you need to balance, but I think um, we, I'm guessing from what I've heard of your taste in music already, I think we would probably agree that sometimes the the, comp, the pipe band competition scene can be too um, too stuck of like we we need to have our MSR and our medley has to be exactly five and a half minutes long or whatever it is, right? Um, and it, it can be stifling to creativity. It, it it isn't it's a it isn't an interesting thing right like I think I have been too flippant at times and said things that I do regret you know because like I've I do have a a real love for the competition scene you know and it's like on the one hand it's like a like to to formalize this stuff is like a it's almost like a a, a preservation tool you know and it can capture stuff and hang, hang on to stuff for us that, you know, a lot of things might have been lost. Tunes, styles of playing, stuff like that, you know, to formalize them kind of preserves them in a way, and that's good, you know. It oh, makes, yeah. It makes a time capsule for all of us to be able to participate in. But at the same time, you know, there's, like you say, there's a fine line there. There's a kind of balance, and, and either it's that that time capsule needs to be bigger or it's that we just need to feel comfortable putting one foot in that world and one foot in another or something. I don't know what the solution is, but... It's a two-edged sword, for sure. There's definitely good that it does for the art form, but I think there's also, you know, it's also restrictive, like you say, it can be anyway. Right, and I think there's there's room for, for both worlds. For sure. Um, the, I think the competition scene, like, I, I do enjoy it. I, I teach some bands. I, um, I, like, I, I love listening to um, really great bands, and it's amazing what they can do, and I also think there's, there's room for this folk side this fusion side mm -hmm. uh and there's some great players who do both you look at like oh, sure. um 
And then there's I, I use uh, like speaking Ross, of Ross Miller, he actually wasn't Ross competing at like the Silver Chanter or the or uh, something. I feel like something. Ross oh yeah, at something yeah. This last year. I mean, a lot of the guys in um, in Verrian District, you take like a Ross Miller, a John Dew. They're they're very much a part of the competition scene and yeah. also kind of pushing the boundaries in the the folk fusion scene. Yeah. Um, and I think there's also space like I love I love Ross Ainsley stuff and Ross. Oh yeah. Is not not a competition fighter. He did he, I think he told me in one of my lessons with him that uh, Gordon told him not to compete and he just never really <laughs> focused really? on uh on competition I and mean, that, whatever he does is great because what he does is great so it's fine you know for this oh yeah his his small pipe album um uh, that was just recently released oh with, with yeah man yeah love uh, that so so speaking good. of use of low notes you remember that tune the badger and the weasel it uses yeah. a, an, a low, what, I, I guess I think it's an F sharp. Pipes, what is that? Yeah, it would be an F oh, sharp on if C. it were on A, but it's on a, C. Yeah. On, on the C pipe, so that um, oh. down, in my, that would be an A. C, yeah, an A. Um, like, man, that's pretty. Man, that's pretty. I love yeah. that track. I mean, I love the whole album, yeah. but that track especially, dude, that one that one lives in my head. Yeah. Um, yeah, and there's, oh, I mean, there's so many now, these small pipes listening to, like, the Lindsay System Chanter. Oh, yeah. It's just, ah. Uh, Oh, there's too much to learn. That's what's there's next for you, right? You got to get yourself a Lindsay system channel. <laughs> oh, I thought about it, and I keep telling myself, I'm like, no, you need to practice more of what you have before you buy another. Yeah, another we, set. we all tell ourselves that. <laughs> you'll, you'll break down eventually. <laughs> someday, someday. Well, speaking uh, of MSRs, that's that's part of why I loved that one that we opened with with Jan Butterworth, um, because I have been told before by my friends when I get all uppity about like, oh, I'm, I'm tired of MSRs, you know, uh, that like, well, look, James, if you listen to good MSRs, you wouldn't be tired of them, you know, and I'm like, <laughs> okay, this one, that was a really good MSR, you know, like <laughs> that set would convince me that, yes, this form is very valuable, you know, um, did you on purpose go like i'm going to use the march stress bay real format for this for this video um for this track right or or was that just like so natural like you have to do it um so what where that came out of is for my master's project i was trying to do nine tracks that were based on countries or regions oh gotcha. so um there was one where i it was based on like loosely based on uh, Cape Breton tunes, and there was a few Cape Breton tunes, and then uh, there was the Irish jig set. Um, there was the set that I did some tunes with, and the harp player wrote a tune for that was like the Connecticut USA set. There was a, a set um, from a, a Swedish set. So the idea was to take these, uh, these tunes from different countries, and that one was, I'm like, what is the, the for piping, what I think of when I think of the Scottish set and mm. it was the March Strats Bay and real ever since I was playing that was like the, the meat and potatoes oh, of totally what sense, I yeah. needed to practice. So I'm like, okay, I too have perhaps listened to too many MSRs in my life where I have become, for lack of a better word, a uh, bored of mm -hmm. listening to March Strats Bay and reels. Um, especially in the band setting, because I felt like there was, everybody was playing the same tunes uh, all at a super high level. Mm -hmm. um, so the, uh, the idea I had with that track was I want to play an MSR, but I want to do it in a way that I would want to listen to it where um, it doesn't sound like every other MSR I've heard mm -hmm. before, however great they may be. Uh, and then I was lucky that Jen Butterworth, who she was a lecturer at RCS uh, and just like a, a, an amazing trad guitarist, um, she she said yes to to playing guitar for it so mm. i i got that that march i learned uh finley mcdonald taught it to me um i think it was written by an accordion player oh. uh john somerville i believe huh. uh great little march um and then the strats bay is a fred morrison tune uh, i just i love fred's strats bays i think they're so melodic yeah um and then the, the, the last one, the reel is The Sound of Sleet, and I arranged it a little bit uh, differently, played it not not pointed. Um, so that's another thing is that I don't think that we need to play every tune necessarily uh, the same way. I, yeah. I, 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 something I see in the competition scene is like there's these unwritten rules of a band, a pipe band is going to play their March Strasbourg and Reel with these tempos and in this style. Mm -hmm. 
and a solo piper, like you take the march, solo pipers play them typically much slower than a pipe band would. Um, and I often wonder like, okay, where do these unwritten rules come from of we have to play a march at this tempo if we're competing solo, we have to play it at, and these are approximate tempos, but at this tempo in the band right, setting. Right. Um, and I know there's reasons for it, but I think uh, we it would be awesome for me to hear two solo players play drastically different tempos on their their marches. Yeah. Um, yeah. And like I, I love listening to fiddle players play play marches because they they'll do things that I wouldn't have thought to do as uh, coming from that that competition background. So that that really in this set is what I was trying to think of like how would I want to listen to it and the the sound of sleep playing it not pointed. Um, changing a few of the notes, um, I think was a big change I made for the reel. And then obviously putting whistle and guitar on it immediately adds to um, a, 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 a more folk setting. So it clearly doesn't sound like a competition MSR. Right. But I, I wanted to take, for, for that track, I, I just wanted to take uh, the idea of that MSR and using it for competition and, and bring it into um, more of a folk setting. Well, add it, some it harmonies worked. to it. It worked well. I love listening to it. And and do w- w- will anybody in the world ever be able to say that they're tired of the sound of sleet? I feel like <laughs> like nope. Like the the I've, that's a tune that's been around since uh, for me. You know, in my in my awareness since I started playing pipes for you know decades now, and I'm still not tired of it. That is just a great tune. It's such a great tune, and it works pointed. It sounds great. It works straight. You can fast, slow. I just think. Um, there's a reason certain tunes last as long as they do, and that yeah. one is, is one that we're gonna keep hearing. Yeah, it, it's so great. Well, well then, how about let's look at another another region. It must have been Ireland you were thinking of with the Irish jigs that you did with. Um, I think that they pronounce this name Ocean McCann, maybe. I I, I think it's Oshin. I think it's Oshin. I, I I'm probably saying it wrong. I remember I had to ask him specifically, and I had him record how to say his name. Uh. Um, and, and then, then, then so and so beaten. Oh, okay, you were going to say Yoan, it. Yoan. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Yoan, I believe it's Yoan Beaton. Gotcha. Uh, again, uh, coming from, from New England, these names are new to me. I was doing my best with here. And again, that was, I was in school with both of them. I met them when I was living in Scotland. And um, that was uh, another one part of the project when we were all kind of locked down. Um, I I wanted to do the Irish set. So Oshin is uh, from Ireland, I believe. Mm-hmm. And he is just a monster musician. I talk about somebody who plays multiple instruments extremely well. Um, so I contacted him about doing an Irish set um, 
selected the tunes, and that one came about. I recorded uh, just kind of, I think I just recorded the Illin Pipe part and, and played it through with a click track, sent it to him uh, for some of his ideas. He put the flute on and he wanted to add um, some guitar as well. Uh, so that was his idea to add the guitar. So he added that, and then um, I think the last step was I, I contacted Yo, and I'm like, I think I, the one I want to add um, Baron to this, and so then that that's how that all kind of came together. I don't know if I had originally thought that I was going to have Baron on that piece, so it's kind of mm. cool how the the process can can grow from I thought it was just going to be an Illin Illin Pipe flute duet. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, it, then that's how that all came apart. And then I think Oshin sent his recordings back to me, and then I re-recorded my Illin Pipe part because I thought that matched what he... So it was it was a back-and-forth process. Um, and that one you can kind of see at least uh, for... At least for the guitar and the Baron, and this is something, another kind of like... record. I think they did those... They recorded the video and the audio at the same time. Oh, uh, yeah. Because um, certain, I guess like Byron in particular, you're not reading notes. It's very hard to <laughs> fake it yeah. and and be playing the same, make sure you're playing the same exact thing. If I'm playing uh, a pipe band setting where I know exactly what grace notes I'm doing, it's pretty easy to play along with myself. But if I play something on the drum kit or, or percussion where I'm improvising a lot of the, uh, the fills or things like that, it, it's hard to reproduce that because it, it comes out different totally, every time. Totally, and have the video sync and everything like that. Yeah. 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 The um, so when when you're looking at like that kind of process, like I, I again, I'm not digging, like I'm not I'm not trying to um be in any way uh, a critical, not at all. Just like there are different methods in different ways, right? So I'm look, just thinking about like that kind of process where you can put together the general idea. And you can kind of hand it to another person and see what they add and then hand it to another person and they hand it back and you end up with this product that it to some degree is like a, even a pleasant surprise to you, you know, like um, you're kind of uh, sharing the creative work in a way. Comparing that to some of the other stuff that you've done where like you're live looping with yourself or you're doing split screen videos with yourself, you know, um, where like maybe that's more work, but you also have tighter control, you know. Um, do you feel like you prefer working one way versus the other, or there's just pros and cons for everything? So for different projects, it's it's different. Um, yeah, any any strong feelings when contrasting those two different sort of like formats for for multi-track recordings? Um, yeah, I think again, like, I think you hit the it, it said it right when there's there's benefits to both. Sometimes um, when I like really want to have all the control and I'm on a ego trip. <laughs> it's fun. It's fun to just record all the parts myself, and that way I know exactly what I wanted to do. I can do as many takes. I can experiment with different things. But then the flip side of that is, it's so cool to hear other people's ideas for something that, like, I just wouldn't have come up with. Yeah. Um, and and that happened with recording with the Harpers Taylor a lot, where I'd send her a track and she'd she'd write out a company part that sounded awesome that I obviously I don't play harp I wouldn't have been able to do that but um it's great to get the feedback of other musicians and then that changes what I like that one where he sent it back to me and then I changed some of my playing um that kind of it it's a really enjoyable process to hear somebody else's ideas and then that changes my uh creative process so it's mm. it's a different challenge but i enjoy them both um it's definitely a lot more work to do the split screen of and record all of the parts myself because that i uh, first <laughs> i have to practice <laughs> all the instruments all of them, yeah. um and then like guitar that's not my primary instrument so that i actually have to practice some parts and i, I still want to get get better at it but um so it's good in that regard, but it definitely takes me takes me a long time yeah. to to do some of those multi track things. Um, and if I haven't been practicing much with guitar, my my poor little <laughs> calluses yeah, are not calluses, right? <laughs> are not built up enough. 
You, you um, don't have to. You don't have to name any names, but I'm just like imagining. Have you ever been in a situation where, like, like with the harp, you, like you say, you don't play harp, and so like you're gonna reach out to a harpist and you say, "Can you do this?" And they'll do something and be like, "Oh, that's great, thank you," you know. But like a lot of these other instruments, you might reach out to somebody and be like, "Will you do a, you know, a, a track with whistle or something like that?" Right? Where it's an instrument that you yourself play. If you had a vision in mind, and then what they send back isn't what you wanted, or you want something different can that be infuriating and then you're stuck in like this social position where it's like i'm just gonna record it myself oh but then they'll know you know yeah so that that can certainly happen um and that that's just part of like navigating social interactions of and and relinquishing some some creative control when you collaborate with people yeah Uh, that's just a part of it uh that certainly can be can be frustrating um and it is often tempting if if it's a part that <laughs> you would would have liked a different way if you can record it that way not to do it uh, but it's never but happened it, to you if anybody who's collaborated with you is listening right now <laughs> it's never happened with Jesse so <laughs> no no the worst thing I'd ever do is lower that part in the mix if I really didn't <laughs> want it to <laughs> but you know, it's still there it's just a little bit I feel like I feel like I heard a story once that like maybe it was like Phil Collins, some somebody who was a big deal, having done like having done like a like a percussion track for George Harrison, uh, you know, decades ago or something, and then like the tune, you know, being released and the part that they'd recorded wasn't on there. It wasn't in the final mix, and then like and then like I think I think it was Phil Collins, and that like he then had asked George about it. He was like, "Why? Where? What happened to that track? I you know that that line I recorded for you." And that George sent him the original cut, and there was this percussion track, and it was just horrible. He was just like, just, just <laughs> horrible. Didn't sound good at all. And he was like, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. I'm so glad you cut that and stuff. And then later he found out that George Harrison had actually recorded a terrible percussion track specifically to send that to Phil Collins, like as a joke or something like that. That's hilarious. I just I've laid a lot of pipe to, to, to relate a very <laughs> <laughs> shaky story, so maybe I shouldn't have done that. But <laughs> No, but to be clear, nobody I've ever collaborated with has, has sent me something that I had to cut out Good. completely. Cool. Um, there's there's certainly – the tuning would be the biggest one. Oh, that sure, yeah. If, especially with, with pipe stuff, if a, if a pipe chanter is not lining up perfect, that would be – I'd say the most common, rather than a creative thing, the most common uh, difficulty is that if – if it's slightly out of tune, I'm not. I'm not using Belladine. I was gonna uh, say, as a, as a matter of principle, do you try to avoid that, or like you know, as long as we're pulling the curtain back, is it okay it's, to use it's that not sometimes? A, it also, I, I, my rule is if it, it whatever sounds good, um, but it, it's not a principle thing that I don't use it. It's just I. It's a lot of editing. Um, yeah. I also don't have the software. It's quite expensive as well. Oh, dude, uh, I, I, and I, I had the correct pitch in GarageBand on my pipes once. Doesn't. Does not sound good. Does not. Yeah. <laughs> but then again, I, there's pitch correction that I think you could do really creatively. Mm. Um, of sometimes you want it to sound that way, mm. uh, and I haven't I haven't gone that down that road in my editing uh, yet. But I, I certainly at some point in my life I will. Use, I have used pitch correction before. There was something on the border pipes where it was one note that I was holding out for. Mm. I want to yeah. say like eight beats and. The, the chanter went flat and rather than just re-record the whole part i just i just did some pitch correction kind for, for a those, little there. yeah a little mm-hmm. bit and i didn't feel guilty about it um it is again uh something that we need to know as 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 listeners that people do this on on their instruments i don't think i'm alone in that i, I but i i'm not a, a great i'm not great at it yet so most of uh most of what you hear is is pretty authentic, um, but I'm not opposed to pitch correction. Yeah. Um, if you ever hear me singing and it sounds good, that yeah. would be pitch. That yeah, would be pitch correction, correction for, for sure. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> so for future reference, if there's a song out and it's it's in tune, yeah, I've I've learned how to <laughs> use. I've learned how to use Melodyne. <laughs> yeah, then we'll know. There will be signs. <laughs> Suddenly, Jesse puts out like a a full vocal album, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Jesse singing all the parts for the the Irish tenors classics or yeah, something. I'll, I'll sound like Drake singing yeah, Irish music. That's right. <laughs> hey, why not? That's the next thing. Huh? That's that's part of it, man. That's part of it. Like like sometimes folks in our community, you know, maybe part of it is the commitment to tradition, right? But sometimes folks in our community get a little uppity about about like pushing envelopes, you know. 
I mean, classic example, of course, is uh, is Gordon Duncan. You know, where like some people be like, oh, you don't play those songs on that instrument, you know, or you know, you don't combine those instruments or whatever, you know. Like sometimes people push the envelope and it's magical and it sticks, but mm -hmm. I don't think we give as much consideration to the fact that like. I think it's a fact anyway, that every time you get an envelope pushing that sticks, that's that's backed up by a couple hundred envelope pushings that didn't stick, you know? But somebody's got to try stuff or you're never going to find out, you know? And so, uh, I, I, I don't know, uh, where, where am I going with this? Maybe I'm just rambling here and ranting here, but it, it feels a little bit like we've got to be open to trying stuff out, even if it's like singing trad Irish stuff like Drake with pitch correction, you know? <laughs> Whatever it is, let's try it and see, and if, if it doesn't stick, at least now we know, and maybe somebody else will do it really well later, and it will stick, you know? Absolutely, and I think there's, um, there's a lot of, like for me, I know there's like some fear of sounding cheesy, sure, or... Sure or not wanting to be judged by other pipers for, for releasing uh, a bagpipe cover. Uh, and that's something like, especially posting stuff on social media where I, I am trying to have the balance of like posting tunes I really like, or that I, I know I'd get more views if I posted more, more bagpipe covers. And I like some of them and some of them work, some of them don't, but it's that pushing that envelope that you have to try it. Uh, and Gordon Duncan, I think that is the great example, like the Jess for Seamus album. Do you know, mm. are you familiar with the story behind that? I, I am familiar with the story, but just in case anybody isn't, like, it would be, let's run a, let's run a short version of it. Like, because honestly, the first time I heard that album, like when I was younger and was first hearing it, I assumed Seamus was like his son or something like that, right? Like that it was a genuine dedication to like a person who he felt That's what for. I had thought as well. Right. But it, that's not the case. <laughs> Seamus was to not, my his knowledge, child. <laughs> <laughs> not his child. To my knowledge, and I'm going to give the big caveat here, this is a word of mouth thing, and I, I'm not 100% sure of the accuracy of this story, but uh, to what my understanding was that uh, when there was a, a piping showcase or something at the college or competition of piping, or something or right? competition and it, it was gordon playing and somebody else um and gordon of course played some pretty wild stuff as, as he did and i think seamus said something along the lines of paraphrasing of like if this is the future of piping i don't i don't want to be a part of it yeah it was definitely uh, something was... like pretty pretty heavy like that for sure yeah um or at least that's and... the version i've heard as well is that yeah he said something like that and then, uh, so then when Gordon released that album, he uh, sarcastically right. titled it Just for Seamus, where it, it really does do some envelope pushing. And I think Gordon's a great example of like, of course, everybody is familiar with him in the piping world of yeah. really pushing envelopes. And I think he also had some tracks that I do hear now that I'm like, oh, that does sound a little bit cheesy, but you have to take those risks. Right. You have to run the risk of like, 10 years from now, being like, oh, what was I doing with that overly reverb uh, cathedral right. setting um, that I don't like that anymore? But that's that happens in any music. And it, it also, like, music, uh, art is a lot like fashion, that there's styles of a certain time. Like, you think about 80s music, um, it, it has a very particular set, 80s pop music. Oh, for sure, um, yeah, man. And it, it sounds dated to us now, but at the time, that was the hippest thing going so when when you're pushing envelopes not all of it is gonna last and sound cool 10 years from now but i think you having the willingness to take those those risks um yeah. is awesome and yeah i'm sure i'm gonna release some stuff that even a year goes by and i'm gonna be like oh i <laughs> i did not like that but um i it, it'll happen and that's just part of the the creative process well and and part of what i love about the internet is like, and not that I'm telling you what to do as, a, as an artist, Jesse, not at all. Like, you do whatever you want to in future, right? But one thing that I do love is when artists aren't overly worried about hiding their past work, you know, to, to match their current, like, sound or look, right? Mm -hmm. And it, because being able to have, like, a readily available archive of how did they get there, you know, where, like, you mm -hmm. can listen to an artist's, like, first few, like, like SoundCloud tracks right and then compare that to the studio album that they just put out and you can hear little seeds of ideas that came to fruition in the album 10 years later you know to be able to see that trajectory I, there's something really cool about that you know yeah and again i think that's uh, one of those one of the great things about social media and seeing people start 
their their process they during their progress and being able to go back i mean so you you did some searching and you found my my old mac talon war days um that i i like through my teenage years i was playing with that family band and then i took a long hiatus i want to say i was still playing the mm -hmm. music but for about 10 years i uh i i became a music teacher at, at a high school and i was playing a lot of drum set there but mostly just teaching and not so involved in the scottish or irish scene mm -hmm. uh and it was really not until i i went back to i i just auditioned on a whim to to go to rca is i i joked about the the doctor and medical school thing but i was going to go to medical school i well, was ready to real, apply <laughs> i was ready to apply to medical school i taken all my uh prereqs and was going to take the mcats and i just i'm like you know what I've always wanted to go to Scotland. I'll, I'll just take a year off from this. And uh, I recorded a, an audition on my phone, um, sent it over, and I'm like, if I get in, I get in. And, and I did, and... Uh, that year now, off uh, is extended. Yeah, yeah <laughs> I, I just, I fell in love with the music again, and I'm like, this is, this is what I want to do. As a, as a person so. who's enjoying the music you produce, I'm glad you made that decision. I hope that you never regret it, because <laughs> I won't, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I'm not very, I'm very happy with the choice right now. <laughs> Hello, friends. Just a quick note to make you aware, this podcast is something that I love doing, and I will keep doing it no matter what. But if you want to send me money, I won't say an A. The easiest way to do that is through Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash droningonpodcast. We do regular drawings for bagpipey albums, books, sheet music, and more, including Droning On Swag. All patrons are in the figurative hat from whence the names of winners are drawn. And there are other benefits to members as well. They're all listed there at patreon.com slash droningonpodcast. And speaking of swag, another way to support the show is to buy cool stuff from my little online shop, bagpipeswag.com. There you can find Droning On stuff as well as other pipey and drummy things that my, uh, that my friends and I make. And if you feel so inclined, I genuinely invite you to follow the show on Facebook. It's super fun to have a way to interact over there, uh, to discuss past episodes, and I also uh, like to bounce ideas off of, off of you, my friends, uh, ask you for input on upcoming interviews, that kind of stuff. Uh, I'd like to invite you to join in on virtual book clubs and uh, probably lots of other cool stuff that uh, I just haven't even thought of yet as of this recording. It's easy to find. Just get on Facebook and search Droning On Podcast. And if Instagram is more your jam, we're also on there at droning.on.podcast. You can also email the show at thedroningonpodcast at gmail.com. And links to these sites, social media accounts, and more are in the show notes. Leaving the show a positive rating and review helps others to find it, so feel free to do that. And thank you again for listening, you cool human you. Now, you, you you've done some Illin Pipe uh, study with Jarleth Henderson. He's in the medical field, isn't he? He's yeah, he's a doctor. I actually we had a lot of conversations about that because he yeah. he, I mean, talk about a talented person. Oh uh, yeah, he's a doc, a doctor, amazing Ellie Piper, amazing singer, super nice guy. Like yeah, the he, music he puts out. I'm like, why isn't he making a living off of music? He could, you know. He's he he certainly could. Um, and I think he he we we discussed that he, I think he's very content. Like he also has that scientific brain. He loves mm. loves medicine. But he also um, plays the gigs he wants to play. Oh, that's, uh, so this that's, is that's a luxury. That's nice. Um, yeah, and that's something that I, I think every professional musician has to figure out a balance for them in their life. Because I, you play a lot of gigs that are you're doing it for money, which there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and then just finding enough of like, for me, some of it becomes like, is this now just a job, or am I right. actually enjoy, enjoying? playing music because if it's just a job I could be making a lot more money doing something something else doctor, man. Um, <laughs> um, so so it's it's again finding that balance of making enough money that you're happy and content and then um, being able to play gigs you enjoy and I think Jarleth um, has a really good thing going where he he has a career he loves and yeah. then he gets to be this amazing Scott, uh, Irish musician yeah. playing some some awesome gigs and and doing the tours. I'm sure he has a very busy schedule doing both the medicine and and track Surely. music. But yeah. uh, and uh, there's some sacrifices that have to be made for both. But I think um, when we discussed it, he really liked that that mm. music was just 
still enjoyable for him that he never had to play gigs he didn't want to play for money. That makes sense. I mean, it's it's a thing that like I think those of us who are like hobbyist musicians not doing it for a living, it like sometimes we maybe tell ourselves that as like a way to make ourselves feel better, you know? Like, well, if I give, you know, like I hate spreadsheets and I do spreadsheets 5 days a week, but it's okay <laughs> to hate spreadsheets cuz then I can play music on the weekend, right? And if I flip-flopped that, then I would hate music and so it's like it's almost like giving ourselves an excuse for not trying harder, you know, to some degree. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And I think there's something to and and teaching. I'm a I'm a, a terrible inspiration to my students. I'm like, don't become a professional musician. <laughs> musician, just do it. Do it. Continue loving it. Um, and, and there's there's a degree of truth in that because it's such a hard field to to make a living in, and then um, it also. Even the, like for me, I, I, there's sometimes where I don't pick up my bagpipes because I, I want to. They're not cathartic to me anymore. The bagpipes in general are not a relaxing instrument to play. Maybe, <laughs> uh, <laughs> maybe small pipes. Um, so for me, I, I, I'm guitar or, or whistles. There's m- much more what I gravitate to. If I'm just playing like after a long day and I want to <laughs> sit yeah. down and enjoy myself, I'm not reaching for my Highland bagpipes. That, <laughs> that <Yeah>. is not my. <laughs> <laughs> my relaxing uh, playing. Um, so, but I think one of the great things about about playing an instrument as a hobbyist, an amateur, or even a, is that you having something that you have that creative outlet for. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's important for people, whether it be art or or music or um, just having an outlet where you can kind of shut off the world and just get get lost in your your creativity. Yeah. Speaking of whistles, do you play Colin Goldie whistles? I do play Colin Goldie whistles. Dude, what did is are those like the only whistles allowed on the professional trad scene? Because I swear, once you notice it, that every that's that's all there is. That's all, it, and I've heard they're great. So that must be that must be why. Are they so great? Are they like the best in the uh, world? So I have not played a lot of other whistles. So my yeah. my my answer for comparison is not great. They are great whistles. I love playing them. Yeah. Um, I I definitely recommend them if you can if you can get on his waiting list to get one or two or twelve. Yeah, there's, I, there's, I definitely... there's another guy who like is at a point where he can he's doing what he loves when he wants to do it. I'm sure, right? Because he's got to have quite the wait list. I think he has the wait list, but the, because they're all handmade, there's only so much he. I think it's still it's still a hustle. Even yeah. like in the world of villain piping, you'd think that I, I in my economic brain, which is not a good economic brain, but I feel like okay, these villain pipers are making instruments for ten plus thousand dollars, and they have a year wait list. They must be rolling in money, but I think they're not. It, it's a lot of cost for the materials. Yeah, it's a lot, a lot of, time of time to make sure. each set one by one. Um, and there's got to be, not... there's got to be time spent with past customers coming back and saying, "I've got a problem with the reed. I've got a problem with the chanter, etc." Right. right. And and Illin pipe makers, it really is like you're buying the instrument, but you're also buying customer support for life right. because it's so finicky. Uh, the the reeds uh, talk about a pain. Um, so yeah, I, I don't I don't think any of the I don't think anybody's rich off of making any traditional instruments so so colin goldie probably isn't swimming in a in a scrooge mcduck style uh no uh, no i think it's still or anything i think it uh goldie coins goldie no. coins uh, <laughs> <laughs> i know i think it's a labor of love for all of them um yeah. and he, he's he's a, he, a really nice guy if you ever call up and and order whistles from him but it, it's super common that i think i think he really um i think overton and goldie not not knowing my whistle history as well as I should. I think they kind of set the standard mm-hmm. for what a low whistle like should or could sound like. Uh, and there's a lot of other great whistles out there um, as yeah, well. Yeah, I so certainly that's not don't to mean say... to speak poorly of other whistle makers, of course. Um, but they, they are they are they are fantastic. And uh, like yeah, it... we talk about spending money on instruments. At some point, I'll probably contact it. <laughs> someone and be like, I want I want twelve keys. Yeah, give me get a whole range. Down, yeah, get. Uh, <laughs> Uh, when I have disposable income, when I win my my first Grammy for putting uh, auto tune on Highland Pipes. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah it, could, it it does seem like you turn on Celtic Connections or any trad fest or anything, and you're gonna see the, that it's 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 got a distinctive profile. You know, it's like just about every every at least every piper that I know of who also picks up whistle. It seems like it's always a Colin Goldie. Yeah. It it, it it's Ross plays Goldies. Um, 
uh, all the Rosses, right? Yeah, yeah, all the Rosses. <laughs> a- I think Lee Miller, etc. <laughs> <laughs> all the uh, 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 oh, what's his? Uh, oh man, now I feel bad. What's his name? Um, Hut- Hutton Hutley. Uh, Al, Al, Allie, Allie Hutton. Allie, Allie, yeah, Allie Hutton. Yep. I think I've seen seen him playing it too. I'm pretty sure, and yeah, it's it's kind of the the gold standard. Not to keep making the same nice. pun. It's the gold um, standard. <laughs> but but I I've, I have played um, some MK whistles. They sound great. There's, oh yeah. Uh, I've there's a guy in New York. I've tried some of Nick. Uh, I think Metcalf is his name. His whistle. I got a low B flat from him. Uh, I can't play it yet. My it's, that's quite a stretch, uh, mm. but there's there's I I want to get my hands on some of the wooden whistles and see how those sound. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I I saw somebody making a keyed whistle. I'm very curious Whoa. about that. Uh, I kind of a I silver come, flute kind of thing turned around. Yeah, yeah. I and I, I I I think because I majored um, in jazz drum set um, for the undergrad, I think. My my brain is constantly wanting to have more chromatic notes oh, sure. than yeah. we we often get on the pipes. Uh, when I was taking lessons with uh, Ross Ainsley, he joked with me. He's like, "You should have been a clarinet player, not a <laughs> not not a border player." Because I kept asking him for tunes with accidentals. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I I anytime I hear whistle players or or pipers kind of trying out new notes, I'm very much drawn to it. Or I, there was a a trend going around with what was it uh what are they, was it a, a drone tune to d oh or yes to c? d yeah we'd pop yeah. the top piece off and yeah yeah, yeah totally. uh, i'm like i was digging that i didn't even try it but that yeah. i love that dude I, I don't know if i'll ever be able to pull it off but i've been talking with uh i've been talking with david over at the 3d printed bagpipes guy because like that that's a you know you can mess around right about like how could we make modular Highland pipe drones, right? With like multiple openings up and down the shaft so you could like pop a cork out to have a different tone all of a sudden. Oh my God. Wouldn't that yeah. be cool? It's, I tried, so I, I tried to like fake this in, in Pro Tools where I, I did some pitch shifting where I'd record between my three or four different types of pipes I had. I had like the oh, B flat, yeah. the A drones, the, I was trying to get chords with drones and they sounded good on their own. It was the switch that I, I need to figure out a more um, natural way of making them sound that way. But yeah, it would be so cool mm. to almost have like a, a pedal board yes, <laughs> like an organist, yes, on except, your with, <laughs> except with drone sounds. Yeah, man, totally. Um, and I, and it would place, I think there's some makers who have done like the switch where they have a, a drone switch where you're tuned to D and you, you click it and it goes over to G. Oh, um, yeah. So there's, there's creative minds at work coming up with these more ways for us to to spend money on these instruments That's <laughs> man jesse i just realized i've been keeping you for an hour and a half are you are you feeling like you're all interviewed out <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm really enjoying myself but if you have any other questions i'm having a great time chatting well, that's the thing i've been having such a nice time i didn't even notice how long we've been talking so i don't want to keep you oh. forever I, I I'd like to think that this podcast is the the Joe Rogan experience of of of, of bagpiping podcast in no way other than a willingness to let episodes run very long. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, um, you know it's it's been it's been great chatting with you. I can't. Uh, I it's always funny hearing yourself speak back when we when we do listen to this. Yeah, uh, I'll course. be like, wow, is is, is my voice really that high pitched i i am a leprechaun um <laughs> a leprechaun. <laughs> and that's that's one thing too just so you know jesse like i i tend to run kind of a lengthy schedule so that i can keep up with it so it might be a few months before i get this one put together and put out but the nice thing about that is that by then you and i will both have forgotten about this conversation and then we can enjoy <laughs> listening to it <laughs> I'll, I'll i'll look forward to it yeah, man. So how about this? We'll go, we'll, we'll fade the episode out on a uh, lullaby for Mel. And let me just mention, I'll insert something into the episode later too, but let me just mention again here that I'll have links to Jesse's work 
in the show notes, you know, the YouTube channel and the bio and anything else that I can find on the internet to make it easy for people to find. I Should I make it really easy to find that photo of you drumming shirtless or should I leave that as like a treasure <laughs> oh. hunt that people just need to look <laughs> if they find it good for them? <laughs> uh, uh, it depends. Do you want Do you want to get a bunch of people to unsubscribe from your, <laughs> your page or not? I'll, I'll leave that decision up to you. Fair enough, fair enough. So look in the show notes and find out if I made this a treasure hunt or not. And then... Uh, and then uh, before we go into Lullaby for Mel, Jesse, just like what do, is there anything on the horizon? Are we are we uh, you know are we all about to be surprised by a tune book from you or an album or you know like what's what's your what are you working on right now? So there is always the thought of an album coming. That I I hope to start recording a full length album. I haven't uh, put a tune book in the works. Maybe if I get this album uh, done and I write a bunch of tunes for it, that would happen. Mm-hmm. Um, so. The album would be the next thing, uh, just releasing, I, I hope to, in 2023, release a lot more material on my um, my my YouTube, my Facebook, my Instagram, my t- I, uh, every, so I can't keep up with all the, the social media trends, but um, I try to, uh, I'm going to release a lot there, and then a full length album, hopefully by the end of 2023, potentially mm-hmm. into 2024, that's the, that's the plan. Um, but as we know, the, the best laid plans of mice and men. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> Good intentions. That's how they paved the road to hell, huh? <laughs> uh, so, so what about this lullaby for Mel? Was this because Ross was one of your instructors? It was pretty easy to be like, Hey man, can I, you know, let's do this tune. Cause he appears in the recording as well. Right? Yeah. So, um, we, I, I got in the, that arrangement, it, it is his, the, the bagpipe harmony arrangement, he also wrote the harmonies for that. Oh, did he? Did he? Um, I did, part of RCS students put on a concert at the Celtic Con- Connections Festival, mm. um, and usually they have like a Highland Pipe feature, and so about four or five of us played it for the concert, Lullaby for Mel. Um, so I, I love the two. Oh yeah. It's and I... I, I I was taking lessons with Ross. I said, hey, um, if I do this recording, would you play on it as well? Um, so it was kind of, it's kind of a mix of his arrangement. And then I had the overall idea of, uh, let me ask my friend Haley Hewitt uh, to play harp on this. Mm-hmm. So she came up with the harp part. Um, and then just the concept of start, starting with the solo pipes and the harp. And then add, add in the second piper. Which, was uh which was Ross and then bring in um all those pipers who most of them were studying at RCS at the time but that I mean in that video the 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 bands I was pretty humbled that all of them agreed to do it and you like you had representation from SFU Field Marshal Inverary um Shots and Dykehead so I'm like wow that's it, it was awesome to play with uh all those yeah that's a stellar great group. pipers well and it comes oh. through in the sound too it's beautiful beautiful recording of it 